Walter Schnaff's Adventure by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Ever since he entered France with the invading army, Walter Schnaff's had considered himself the most unfortunate of men. He was large, had difficulty in walking, was short of breath, and suffered frightfully with his feet, which were very flat and very fat. But he was a peaceful, benevolent man, not warlike or sanguinary, the father of four children whom he adored, and married to a little blonde whose little tendernesses, attentions, and kisses he recalled with despair every evening. He liked to rise late and retire early to eat good things in a leisurely manner, and to drink beer in the saloon. He reflected, besides, that all that is sweet in existence vanishes with life, and he maintained in his heart a fearful hatred, instinctive as well as logical, for cannon, rifles, revolvers, and swords, but especially for bayonets, feeling that he was unable to dodge this dangerous weapon rapidly enough to protect his big paunch and when night fell and he lay on the ground, wrapped in his cape beside his comrades who were snoring, he thought long and deeply about those he had left behind and of the dangers in his path. If he were killed, what would become of the little ones? Who would provide for them and bring them up? Just at present they were not rich, although he had borrowed when he left so as to leave them some money and Walter Schnaff's wept when he thought of all this. At the beginning of a battle his legs became so weak that he would have fallen if he had not reflected that the entire army would pass over his body. The whistling of the bullets gave him goose-flesh. For months he had lived thus in terror and anguish. His company was marching on Normandy and one day he was sent to reconnoitre with a small detachment, simply to explore a portion of the territory and to return at once. All seemed quiet in the country. Nothing indicated an armed resistance. But as the Prussians were quietly descending into a little valley traversed by deep ravines, a sharp fusillade made them all halt suddenly, killing twenty of their men, and a company of sharpshooters suddenly emerging from a little wood as large as your hand, darted forward with bayonets at the end of their rifles. Walter Schnaffs remained motionless at first, so surprised and bewildered that he did not even think of making his escape. Then he was seized with a wild desire to run away, but he remembered at once that he ran like a tortoise compared with those thin Frenchmen who came bounding along like a lot of goats. Perceiving a large ditch full of brushwood covered with dead leaves about six paces in front of him, he sprang into it with both feet together, without stopping to think of its length, just as one jumps from a bridge into the river. He fell like an arrow through a thick layer of vines and thorny brambles that tore his face and hands, and landed heavily in a sitting posture on a bed of stones. Raising his eyes, he saw the sky through the hole he had made in falling through. This aperture might betray him, and he crawled along carefully on hands and knees at the bottom of this ditch beneath the covering of interlacing branches, going as fast as he could and getting away from the scene of the skirmish. Presently he stopped and sat down, crouched like a hare amid the tall dry grass. He heard firing and cries and groans going on for some time. Then the noise of fighting grew fainter and ceased. All was quiet and silent. Suddenly something stirred beside him. He was frightfully startled. It was a little bird which had perched on a branch and was moving the dead leaves. For almost an hour Walter Schnaff's heart beat loud and rapidly. Night fell, filling the ravine with its shadows. The soldier began to think. What was he to do? What was to become of him? Should he rejoin the army? 
"'But how? By what road?' And he began over again the horrible life of anguish, of terror, of fatigue and suffering that he had led since the commencement of the war. No, he no longer had the courage. He would not have the energy necessary to endure long marches and to face the danger to which one was exposed at every moment. But what should he do? He could not stay in this ravine in concealment until the end of hostilities. But no, indeed, if it were not for having to eat, this prospect would not have daunted him greatly. But he had to eat, to eat every day. And here he was, alone, armed, and in uniform, on the enemy's territory, far from those who would protect him. A shiver ran over him. All at once he thought, If I were only a prisoner! And his heart quivered with a longing, an intense desire to be taken prisoner by the French. A prisoner he would be saved! fed, housed, sheltered from bullets and swords, without any apprehension whatever, in a good, well-kept prison. A prisoner! What a dream! His resolution was formed at once. I will constitute myself a prisoner. He rose, determined to put this plan into execution without a moment's delay. But he stood motionless suddenly a prey to disturbing reflections and fresh terrors. Where would he make himself a prisoner, and how? What direction? And frightful pictures, pictures of death, came into his mind. He would run terrible danger in venturing alone through the country with his pointed helmet. Supposing he would meet some peasants, these peasants, seeing a Prussian who had lost his way, an unprotected Prussian, would kill him as if he were a stray dog. They would murder him with their forks, their picks, their scythes, and their shovels. They would make a stew of him, a pie, with the frenzy of exasperated, conquered enemies. If he should meet the sharpshooters, these sharpshooters, madmen without law or discipline, would shoot him just for amusement to pass an hour. It would make them laugh to see his head and he fancied he was already leaning against a wall in front of four rifles, whose little black apertures seemed to be gazing at him. Supposing he should meet the French army itself, the vanguard would take him for a scout, for some bold and sly trooper who had set off alone to reconnoitre, and they would fire at him, and he could already hear, in imagination, the irregular shots of soldiers lying in the brush while he himself, standing in the middle of the field, was sinking to the earth, riddled like a sieve with bullets which he felt piercing his flesh. He sat down again in despair. His situation seemed hopeless. It was quite a dark, black, and silent night. He no longer budged, trembling at all the slight and unfamiliar sounds that occur at night. The sound of a rabbit crouching at the edge of his burrow almost made him run. The cry of an owl caused him positive anguish, giving him a nervous shock that pained like a wound. He opened his big eyes as wide as possible to try and see through the darkness, and he imagined every moment that he heard someone walking close beside him. After interminable hours in which he suffered the tortures of the damned, he noticed through his leafy cover that the sky was becoming bright. He at once felt an intense relief. His limbs stretched out, suddenly relaxed, his heart quieted down, his eyes closed, he fell asleep. When he awoke, the sun appeared to be almost at the meridian. It must be noon. No sound disturbed the gloomy silence. Walter Schnaffs noticed that he was exceedingly hungry. He yawned, his mouth watering at the thought of sausage, the good sausage the soldiers have, and he felt a gnawing at his stomach. He rose from the ground, walked a few steps, found that his legs were weak, and sat down to reflect. 
For two or three hours he again considered the pros and cons, changing his mind every moment, baffled, unhappy, torn by the most conflicting motives. Finally, he had an idea that seemed logical and practical. It was to watch for a villager passing by alone, unarmed and with no dangerous tools of his trade, and to run to him and give himself up, making him understand that he was surrendering. He took off his helmet, the point of which might betray him, and put his head out of his hiding-place with the utmost caution. No solitary pedestrian could be perceived on the horizon. Yonder, to the right, smoke rose from the chimney of a little village, smoke from kitchen fires, and yonder, to the left, he saw at the end of an avenue of trees a large turreted chateau. He waited till evening suffering frightfully from hunger, seeing nothing but flights of crows, hearing nothing but the silent expostulation of his empty stomach. And darkness once more fell on him. He stretched himself out in his retreat, and slept a feverish sleep, haunted by nightmares, the sleep of a starving man. Dawn again broke above his head, and he began to make his observations, but the landscape was deserted as on the previous day, and a new fear came into Walter Schnaff's mind, the fear of death by hunger. He pictured himself lying at full length on his back at the bottom of his hiding-place, with his two eyes closed, and animals, little creatures of all kinds, approached and began to feed on his dead body, attacking it all over at once, gliding beneath his clothing to bite his cold flesh and a big crow pecked out his eyes with its sharp beak. He almost became crazy, thinking he was going to faint and would not be able to walk, and he was just preparing to rush off to the village, determined to dare anything, to brave everything, when he perceived three peasants walking to the fields with their forks across their shoulders, and he dived back into his hiding-place but as soon as it grew dark he slowly emerged from the ditch and started off, stooping and fearful, with beating heart, towards the distant chateau, preferring to go there rather than to the village, which seemed to him as formidable as a den of tigers. The lower windows were brilliantly lighted. One of them was open, and from it escaped a strong odour of roast meat an odour which suddenly penetrated to the old factories and to the stomach of Walter Schnaff's, tickling his nerves, making him breathe quickly, attracting him irresistibly, and inspiring his heart with the boldness of desperation. And abruptly, without reflection, he placed himself, helmet on head, in front of the window. Eight servants were at dinner around a large table, but suddenly one of the maids sat there, her mouth agape, her eyes fixed and letting fall her glass. They all followed the direction of her gaze. They saw the enemy. Good God! The Prussians were attacking the chateau! There was a shriek, only one shriek made up of eight shrieks uttered in eight different keys, a terrific screaming of terror. Then a tumultuous rising from their seats, a jostling, a scrimmage, and a wild rush to the door at the farther end. Chairs fell over. The men knocked the women down and walked over them. In two seconds the room was empty, deserted, and the table, covered with eatables, stood in front of Walter Schnaff's, lost in amazement and still standing at the window. After some moments of hesitation he climbed in at the window and approached the table. His fierce hunger caused him to tremble as if he were in a fever, but fear still held him back, numbed him. He listened. The entire house seemed to shudder. Doors closed, quick steps ran along the floor above. The uneasy Prussian listened eagerly to these confused sounds. Then he heard dull sounds, as though bodies were falling to the ground at the foot of the walls, human beings jumping from the first floor. Then all motion, all disturbance ceased, and the great chateau became as silent as the grave. Walter Schnaff sat down before a clean plate and began to eat. 
He took great mouthfuls, as if he feared he might be interrupted before he had swallowed enough. He shoveled the food into his mouth, open like a trap, with both hands, and chunks of food went into his stomach, swelling out his throat as it passed down. Now and then he stopped, almost ready to burst like a stopped-up pipe. Then he would take the cider jug and wash down his esophagus as one washes out a clogged rain-pipe. He emptied all the plates, all the dishes, and all the bottles. Then, intoxicated with drink and food, besotted, red in the face, shaken by hiccups, his mind clouded and his speech thick, he unbuttoned his uniform in order to breathe, or he could not have taken a step. His eyes closed, his mind became torpid. He leaned his heavy forehead on his folded arms on the table, and gradually lost all consciousness of things and events. The last quarter of the moon above the trees in the park shed a faint light on the landscape. It was the chill hour that precedes the dawn. Numerous silent shadows glided among the trees, and occasionally a blade of steel gleamed in the shadow as a ray of moonlight struck it. The quiet chateau stood there in dark outline. Only two windows were still lighted up on the ground floor. Suddenly a voice thundered. Forward! Nom, nom, nom! To the breach, my lads! And in an instant the doors, shutters, and window-panes fell in beneath a wave of men, who rushed in, breaking, destroying everything, and took the house by storm. In a moment fifty soldiers, armed to the teeth, bounded into the kitchen where Walter Schnaufs was peacefully sleeping, and placing to his breast fifty loaded rifles, they overturned him, rolled him on the floor, seized him, and tied his head and feet together. He gasped in amazement, too besotted to understand, perplexed, bruised, and wild with fear. Suddenly a big soldier, covered with gold lace, put his feet on his stomach, shouting, "'You are my prisoner! Surrender!' The Prussian heard only the one word, prisoner, and he sighed, "Ya, ya, ya." He was raised from the floor, tied in a chair, and examined with lively curiosity by his victors, who were blowing like whales. Several of them sat down, done up with excitement and fatigue. He smiled, actually smiled, secure now that he was at last a prisoner. Another officer came into the room and said, "'Colonel, the enemy has escaped. Several seem to have been wounded. We are in possession.' The big officer, who was wiping his forehead, exclaimed, "'Victory!' and he wrote in a little business memorandum book which he took from his pocket, "'After a desperate encounter the Prussians were obliged to beat a retreat, carrying with them their dead and wounded, the number of whom is estimated at fifty men.' Several were taken prisoners. The young officer inquired, "'What step shall I take, Colonel?' "'We will retire in good order,' replied the Colonel, "'to avoid having to return and make another attack with artillery and a larger force of men.' And he gave the command to set out. The column drew up in a line in the darkness beneath the walls of the chateau, and filed out a guard of six soldiers with revolvers in their hands surrounding Walter Schnaffs, who was firmly bound. Scouts were sent ahead to reconnoitre. They advanced cautiously, halting from time to time. At daybreak they arrived at the district of La roche whose National Guard had accomplished this feat of arms. The uneasy and excited inhabitants were expecting them. When they saw the prisoner's helmet, tremendous shouts arose. The women raised their ten arms in wonder. The old people wept. An old grandfather threw his crutch at the Prussian and struck the nose of one of their defenders. The colonel roared, "'See that the prisoner is secure!' At length they reached the town hall. The prison was opened, and Walter Schnaffs, freed from his bonds, cast into it. Two hundred armed men mounted guard outside the building. 
Then, in spite of the indigestion that had been troubling him for some time, the Prussian, wild with joy, began to dance about, to dance frantically, throwing out his arms and legs and uttering wild shouts until he fell down exhausted beside the wall. He was a prisoner saved. That was how the Chateau de Charpigny was taken from the enemy after only six hours of occupation. Colonel Rattier, a cloth merchant, who had led the assault at the head of a body of the National Guard of La Rochoiselle, was decorated with an order. End of Walter Schnaff's Adventure